Thank you so much for that warm welcome and for the kind introduction and to all of you for being here today. When I graduated from law school 20 years ago, I was pretty well equipped to write a brief, spot an issue, craft an argument, but I had absolutely no idea how to write or manage to a budget or what an accrual was or why I cared or an alternative fee arrangement. And that is because back then, the sphere of the business of law and the practice of law, they were separate. Well, that's just not the way the world works today, particularly for in-house counsel who are tasked not only with managing outcomes and risk, but making sure that they are getting value for dollars. And so what my co-presenter here and I are going to talk to you about today is how to have it all and do it in the ever-changing, difficult world of complex litigation. A moment on my background. I, I did practice law, I did complex litigation work for 17 years, first at Simpson Thatcher and then at Oric, where I was a partner for a long time. But now, I'm pretty much a data geek. So my company, uh, Digitory Legal, does cost analytics uh, platform and services to help bring data-driven cost pricing and cost management to law. And we do it with a mission. That mission is to help law firms and legal departments succeed in an evolving legal market. And I mention that mission because, you know, some of the problems that I'm about to talk about, they're not new, but they do have a new urgency and they need to be attacked and addressed in new ways. And the problems start here. Ask a law firm, what a complex litigation would cost, and typically, historically, the answer would be some version of this. And I call that the snowflake problem because part of it is cultural, based on the deeply ingrained belief within our profession that because every piece of complex work is unique, like a snowflake, it's really just impossible to estimate the cost. Now, I did, as I mentioned, practice law for 17 years. I was a partner for many of those. And for most of that time, this answer worked. And that meant that there was no real incentive for law firms to dig in, to scope out their matters, to manage their data, to stop guessing. Because clients thought legal was different. They thought every case was a snowflake too. That is no longer true. Today's corporate legal departments are under immense pressure to forecast ac accurately, do more with less, show value for dollars spent. And you can see this shift in the meteoric rise of legal operations and legal procurement. These are two job categories that did not exist five years ago and are now two of the most vocal and powerful forces of change in law. And the mission of these professionals is to apply traditional business discipline to law, and these are the tools they are using to fulfill that mandate. And what you're seeing now is a rising tide of alternative fee arrangements, budget caps, competitive bid situations that are affecting even the most complex work. So bottom line, whether you're inside counsel or outside counsel, you must cost out your complex work with more precision and make sure that there is more value in your spend than has ever been done before. And getting this right is mission critical. Which brings us to the reason it's hard. <laughs> Turns out that that snowflake approach has consequences because historically, industry-wide, we have not managed data well particularly in the billing context. And that has created what I call data debt. We got a lot of it, doesn't tell you anything. And so when you try to run analytics on that data without first making it actionable, I'm gonna come back to that concept, 
you're basically putting lipstick on a pig. You might have a shiny dashboard, look under the hood, everything it says is meaningless and wrong. Now, actionable data. All right, I did mention, I did warn you that I am a data geek and now we're gonna go deep into why. The reason that I am the way I am, that I am so passionate about data, is because I have seen its power. Nothing moves the needle faster and more effectively in this industry than actionable data. Actionable, it's an important modifier. And when I talk about actionable data, I mean four elements, four qualities. It is granular, task level, activity level data that is well labeled, accurately and consistently coded, and connected to context, the why behind the numbers. That's decision grade insight, that's data driven pricing. So geek that I am, I'm now moving to Galileo quotes. <laughs> <laughs> but I love this quote because it underscores why getting actionable data is important. Because that which gets measured gets managed. It can be improved. It can be predicted. It can be changed. But I also love this quote because today, with a technology assist, we in fact can measure the unmeasurable. And legal billing data is the perfect example because this opaque jumbled mess is what an industry standard billing file looks like. It is dirty, it is confusing, it is poorly structured. If anyone attached codes to it at all, they did it inconsistently and wrong and at far too high a level for you to see value. But technology can help you unlock all of the rich detail within that da data to give you what you no need to know to make accurate cost predictions, to estimate well, to see value behind the numbers. And what you're seeing here is a visualization of what I call actionable data. Couple important pieces you'll notice is that you can see scope, the tasks that were done. And that is incredibly valuable for a couple of reasons. First, that's the only way you as inside counsel can possibly compare apples to apples. It is the only way to get unit costs that will anchor your budget or your spend when circumstances change. And let's face it, they will. So when you go from five depositions to 55, that shouldn't be a fight, it should be a math problem. It is also necessary to have this level of detail to understand staffing. And you care about that because you're looking for quality. Are you getting the high level resources where you want them on the key tasks that have the most value and efficiency? Are lower cost resources being used where appropriate? Now to continue on my geeking out, I'm gonna note a couple of things. Um, first, doing this will take using a budget format or a data structure that is more detailed than the industry standard codes. One quick example, now I'm really gonna geek out, L330 is an industry standard code for deposition work. So all your depositions get dumped into that bucket. Tells you nothing about why those numbers are what they are. So break them down. Break out how many of what kind, and that is actionable data. But you gotta have do a little work to get there. The second piece is for those inside counsel who think about billing guidelines, the key to getting all of this is in the quality of your narratives, what your lawyers are writing down. So if you have vagueness guidelines, vagueness rules in your outside billing guidelines. If you don't have them, add them. And if you have them, enforce them. And on the law firm side, you need to focus on that as well because if your data quality is poor, you can't get to actionable insight. And your data needs to tell the truth. Um, and this is a visual depiction of that accurately and consistently coded point. That 
big blue line you see there is the before and the green is the after. That big blue line is the universal dumping ground for data in litigation. It's called analysis and strategy. What do you do that isn't analysis and strategy? Well, it turns out when that data is processed correctly and turned into the truth, what is actually happening is revealed. So let's get to the why you care, the use cases. And I'm going to start going back to a construction analogy. Because when you think about it, complex litigation has a whole lot in common with a big construction project. If you don't scope it well and measure it and manage it throughout, you're going to end up with a money pit. Now, I like to make this analogy a little bit personal. So what you're looking at isn't anybody's kitchen. That's my kitchen. <laughs> and the reason you're looking at my kitchen is because I am actually the only person I know who's been through a massive remodel and still likes their contractor. <laughs> and the reason for that isn't because nothing changed. Of course it did. It's because before anybody did any work, we became educated consumers and made sure that that project was scoped down to the nail. And that sent clear expectations and created accountability on both sides. And we had a material change order process because stuff happens, things change. So when I wandered into that kitchen and said, you know, I think some pendant lights would look cool here. I didn't end up with some multi-thousand dollar bill that I didn't expect. That was a material change order. We had the budget to prove it. They gave me a number, and then they could get paid. And that gave me this. So for the law firms in the audience, I'm going to take this construction analogy a little bit further. This contractor got seven figures in referral work within six, six months. Not because my kitchen is pretty, which it is, by the way, <laughs> but because of this. Deliver this to your clients. Legal operations, key performance indicator is budget to actual. So give them this, and you will get more work. And that which gets measured can be predicted. I'm going back to my snowflakes. Because when you have actionable data, patterns in snowflakes start to emerge. And when you have that data at scale, you can suddenly start predicting and estimating costs for different kinds of complex work with an unprecedented level of precision and deliver that no surprises value. Now, that which gets measured can be improved. It can be changed. We are a certified women-owned business. Diversity is part of our mission. It is very important to me as a woman who is in law and is now in tech. It is extremely important to me. And actionable data can take your diversity initiatives to the next level. Because when you unpack that big dumping ground of analysis and strategy and see what is actually happening, who is doing what, you can see if your diverse lawyers are getting the same career advancing opportunities as your non-diverse lawyers, or maybe you'll see something different. Perhaps senior level women doing a disproportionate amount of what's known as L190 case administration, project management. Important, doesn't get you made partner, doesn't turn you into a rainmaker, needs to be distributed equitably. And when you see it, you can fix it before that diverse talent walks out the door. And finally, data geek that I am, I want to talk a little bit about the research behind what we do. Because you don't walk away from a big law partnership without doing some homework, and I did. And what we found is that in this emerging market, whether you're on the law firm side or on the corporate in-house side, there are three core keys to success. And they start with an understanding, a deep understanding of your own costs down to a task level, a focus on resource management, resource alignment, and very clear communication 
both internally and externally around expectations. And those are the cornerstones of success in the modern market. And those are the things that you as an in-house team want to be thinking about and making sure that your outside counsel is thinking about as well. And now to Ozzy. So I'm going to introduce Ozzy uh, uh, with a little bit of a war story. Because there's a reason I thought of uh, uh, him when I got the opportunity to do this presentation. Back when I was a young, eager lawyer, <laughs> I was staffed on a case with Mr. Cousins here. And being the eager lawyer that I um, was, wanting to craft the best articles to win at all costs, I started coming up with ideas for novel legal, legal theories. And Oswald said to me, that's, that's great. You're, you're, I'm, I might be improvising. You're clearly brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but take a breath. What does this mean in terms of the value to the client? Does that make sense for this case from the business needs? And so for me, when I started thinking about how to combine the concepts of excellence in service and business needs, business acumen, Oswald Cousins was my mentor. So with that, I hope I embarrassed you. <laughs> I, will, I turn over the mic. I, I think we remember different things. <laughs> I, I, I feel like we remember that case differently. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, that, that does uh, bring up an important point. I want to talk about this perfect combination. I did not choose this very small St. Bernard carrying a very large cat slide. <laughs> but what it's supposed to represent is that there's some competing goals in litigation. Um, you're competing on one side with the risk issue. You want to win, right? Your company has been sued. Um, someone is, is trying to take what's yours from you or make you pay them a whole bunch of money on one side. And the other side, you don't want to have to pay a lot of money to do it. Um, and it, it is a, there is a tension there. And, I, and I'll give you some of my background is, is I'm with a very, very large firm now. And I started out my career, and most of my career was with very large firms. And when you're with these big firms, uh, the rates are high, but you also have almost like limitless resources, you have clients who are willing to pay for it. And when I started out in employment law, and I think employment law is going to be a good area to, to um, show what, what the, the cost, the management, risk management problems are, is because in employment law when I started out was, was the mid-90s. And in the mid-90s, um, there was a lot of sort of uncharted territory in employment law. So you had people scared of, of maybe a single plane of discrimination case. You, had, you hadn't had the big wage and hour law, uh, class action starting up in full force yet. And nobody really knew what was going on. A lot of the law was unsettled. And so people were willing to pay a lot of money to, to litigate even single plane of discrimination cases and, and even single plaintiff harassment cases. For me, the challenge for me has always been to be able to do the kind of work I want, still give value, still litigate in a sense, in a way that I can be proud of without bankrupting my clients, without also making my clients think, oh, wow, I've just paid way too much for that case. So there is that tension. There's a tension of how do I manage my budgets? Um, how do I keep the client happy? And importantly for me, how do I win? How do I get, get something that is a win? And we're going to talk about that later, about what a win means. And that has changed over the course of my career, what, how I define a win. That's going to become important. The first thing that I want to talk about is preparedness up front. And I think it's worth early on doing the work up front in the beginning of a case, Pref preferably before you get sued on a case. And I'm going to talk a couple, little bit about some things you can do even before you get sued at all to make sure you're ready for litigation before it comes. And then second all, secondly, there's a trust issue between the client and your lawyers that you have to develop. And there has to be communication. And you have to trust your lawyers that when they do something, they're asking for something. They're not doing it because they want to charge you money. They're doing it because they want to help you advance this case in a way that helps you achieve your goals as in-house counsel. Um, so we start with this concept of a stitch in time saves nine, which honestly, I actually had to look it up after we came up with the slide. Because <laughs> I was like, nine, nine what? Um, it turns out it's nine stitches is, is what that means. Um, it's not the nine lives of that weird cat in the first slide. Uh, <clears throat> but what it means is if you do a fair amount of work in the beginning, 
and put in maybe a little bit more work than you're used to and really focus targeted work, not just going through the motions. Okay, we got to do a fact investigation. Give me every document, run through, give me all of your ESI, and um, we're going to run out and do this, this. You're going to get a whole bunch of memos that no one's ever going to look at later on. I mean, really focus work where you're trying to figure out what's this case about, how are we going to win it, how are we going to lose it, and what are the, really the key facts? And that does a lot for me. If I can come up with my theory of the case early on, I understand the law. I know what my jury instructions are going to look like at the end of the day early. Because you start there, that frames everything for you. That allows me to then proceed throughout the whole case based on that outline or that model. And I can, I can not only internally organize my case structure and focus my discovery using that, but I can also present a picture to the other side that, look, no matter what happens in this case, I'm going to be ready for you. If we don't get summary judgment, fine, we're going to try the case, and this is how I'm going to try the case, and this is what we're going to do. And if I can come out of the gate being able to do that, great. And those are the best cases, and a lot of times I'm able to get rid of those cases for relatively low numbers uh, relatively quickly. And I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, I had a case a couple years ago which was a wrongful death case, and it was a case where someone had actually committed to the, the, the plaintiff's, it was by the plaintiff's family, and there had actually been a death the person committed suicide after termination. That's a scary case because it was very emotional. Um, even though it was a single plaintiff case, that could lead to potentially millions of dollars in damages. I mean, not talking just even single millions, like, like 100 or more millions, especially given the, the attorney who was bringing the case on the other side. Um, so it was really important there to get it out ahead of that, really figure out what happened. You actually have to get out there and talk to all the decision makers, not just say, OK, these are the decision makers. This is the company's documents. You get out there and you talk to them. And then once I got into that and was actually talking to people, you realize that this case isn't the case that they've pre presented. And I spent the time to prepare a detailed letter um, with including exhibits. There's, there's some dispute over whether you include all these exhibits in that first letter. Send it over to the other side, basically explaining your theory of the case is wrong. Here's why it's wrong. And this is going to be a really ugly case for you to litigate because, one, you're, it's going to expose um, something about this plaintiff that the survivors didn't realize as to why this person was actually terminated. It's going to be a very ugly case. I appeal to the emotional aspects, too. And we were able to get the case essentially dismissed um, after that. But that's because I did the work up front. I gave them the proof. I didn't say, OK, I'm going to bluff. I'm going to say you don't have a case and do the standard things. I think it's worth it to know what your case is going to look like, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. If other cases where I've looked at a case and it's been apparently weak from the beginning, I'm able to manage my client's expectations much better from that point on. I'm able to say, this is what, where we're going to have some weak spots. This is our potential exposure here. And this is what we can do now to mitigate that exposure. And that gets to the next issue about defining the goals, is I need to define what the goals are. When I started out, um, my only goal was to win. I didn't care. I would kill myself to win. I really would. <laughs> I, would I, I, I lost all my friends probably my first <laughs> few years ago. Because I would go in on the weekends just to work, just because cause someone on the other side ticked me off, whatever it was. <laughs> I was going to do whatever I needed to do to work harder than the other side to win. And you're an associate, so you're not looking at the bills. Um, and also, you're at a big firm, so maybe everyone's paying the bills for that kind of stuff. And it was great. And you could get great results doing that. But not every case warrants that. And that's not appropriate for every case. And, and I had a client recently who, who uses a number of different firms for different matters, but all similar kinds of cases. Um, and they are explaining to me that, that one of the things they like is I try to be creative in the beginning. I try to figure out easy ways for us to get out of the cases without having to go through all the normal uh, procedures. I don't rush out and file a motion to dismiss or a demur right off the bat routinely. Um, there's a lot of things I don't do because I think they could end up being a waste of time and not really advance the ball. And their complaint is that they'll have cases where they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation. You're a year and a half in the litigation. They don't know what really what the theory of the case is yet. They haven't really gotten anywhere. They don't even know what the other side wants. Um, and then they'll find out later that they could have settled the case right off the bat for a fraction of what they've spent in legal costs. And, and I think that's why it's important to be really um, open and trusting with your, your clients and with your, um, your outside counsel to understand what are their goals. What is a win for this situation, for this case, and what's a win for this client? Um, for me, a win would just be to, to destroy the other side, and hopefully they'll stop practicing law. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but that takes a lot of work, and I've never actually been able to do that yet. <laughs> um, and and I'm, I'm not 
24 years old anymore. <laughs> so I do need some sleep now and then. So, <laughs> so what, what is a win? A win could be you're going to get this case uh, finished early, cost effectively, and it's not going to be disrupting our business anymore. And you have a certain time frame where you can get it done. You also have to consider whether your client has other goals. They, you have clients, especially in emerging companies, who want to try to get financing. They may want to set themselves up for IPOs. They don't want litigation hanging out there. So there are these other competing goals, and you have to keep that into account and communicate that to your outside counsel. And you as outside counsel have to then appreciate that and take that into account as well. What is it to the other, other side? What does the other side want in the case? That's the value to opponent and prospect. I like to get demands early, and, and I like to have that discussion start early just to see where they're coming from, because that helps you decide how aggressively you're going to litigate this case. Uh, one of the, my clients was telling me a story about a case where the other side probably, with, uh, their, their attorneys in the first two months had probably spent over $100,000. And they realized, though, that there was, when they finally got a demand from the, the other side, the demand was for far less than that. And if they had solicited the demand right up front, I don't, I don't believe it shows weakness, but if they solicited it right up front, they would have been able to put some perspective on the case, and then maybe that could have just initiated settlement discussions before a lot of unnecessary motion practice and before a lot of routine discovery had been incurred. And then you need to know, if you're going to decide what your goal is, how are you winning this case, what are you going to do to win it? Um, and that's where things like the staffing and the budgets become critically important. Um, staffing. When I started out, we might have cases that were large class actions, or they might be very aggressive multi-plaintiff cases involving maybe 10, 15 plaintiffs alleging something very, uh, very serious that was going to require a lot of work from a lot of different people. So we might have large teams. I believe the case that uh, Catherine was talking about was a relatively leanly staffed case. And I'll talk about that one a little bit because Catherine and I do s different things. We're both at Oric, We both did litigation. But in litigation, in a, her litigation, it was generally large consumer class actions and product liability type things. And, and, and the stakes were extremely high always. Like every one of those cases was going to live or die in the multi-million dollar range probably. And so you're going to approach a case like that a lot differently. Those are bet the business type of cases almost every time. Um, the cases I do, they can be bet the business. A trade secret dispute might be a bet the business case because someone has walked off with the crown jewels of your company, and you want to make sure that you aren't going to lose your market share or be put out of business by, by this move. Um, but some cases might be um, a store clerk got fired, or it might be a, an assistant is complaining that they didn't get paid a certain amount, and the amount of value isn't that much. So you need to really tailor the way you're approaching that case to the needs of the client in that case and to the, the goals you're trying to achieve. And that's another important lesson I had. Uh, from a, it was from a client. It was from a large client. They had the resources. They had the money. And they, their general counsel said, look, you guys, the other side's lean and mean. They're almost sort of like guerrilla warriors. They file whatever they want. It looks like garbage. And you guys sneer at it. But it kind of gets them what they want. And if it doesn't get them what they want, they haven't spent a lot of trying to do it. And we would be on the other side going, OK, well, well let's let that citation's important, appropriate. <laughs> and doing like word counts and all this stuff. And she says, I get it. I get it. You want to do A-level work. This case doesn't need A-level work. It needs you to figure out what's important and do that. And if there's a typo in there once in a while, I'm not going to hold, you, hold, you know, hold that against you. That doesn't mean we want typos. But it just means that you really need to understand the needs of that case and focus your litigation to the needs of that case. You don't need to do the A-level work every time, even though I will. Uh, <laughs> but, but it doesn't mean you should have to pay for it all the time. And, and I think what that requires is a certain level of trust between you and your attorneys. If you're, if you're in-house counsel, it shouldn't be you against the other side for your attorneys. That relationship is critical. Um, it's, it should be the fact that, look, even if, depending on what kind of a fee arrangement you have, and I'll, and I'll talk about that a bit, is we've had fee arrangements, for example, where we do these uh, flat fee arrangements or, or phased fee arrangements, where you're going to get a certain amount for certain parts of the litigation. And if you're really rigid about that all the time, you're going to find out that your client, your attorneys might be shortcutting things. If you're not looking to be flexible, if you're not looking to be um, reasonable and saying, look, we get it. This case isn't the case we thought it was going to be in the beginning. Let's adjust that a little bit here, or maybe we'll adjust that in the next case, or just something so that they don't think you're just trying to um, take advantage of every single case every single time and get every, um, every last uh, nickel out of, out of your, your outside counsel. I think that requires that relationship and that trust, that you trust that your attorneys are acting in your best interests, and you want to them to succeed. 
I think one thing you can do early on is bring your attorneys into your business and help them understand the business and understand what you're dealing with. Um, one, of, one of the better relationships I've had, one of the first things we did is, is I flew across the country to go to, this, to meet with the client, saw their headquarters. We actually went through their training to see what their training looks like at the store level. <laughs> you know, just the, the basic stuff. So I really understood what they were talking about and how, what they were dealing with, what their workers did. I understood that my client was an in-house counsel who was managing litigation across the entire country from basically a, effectively a small cubicle with two people helping them. And it was amazing how leanly staffed they were, but you also appreciate what they're dealing with, that they need you to be efficient and they need you to be um, timely with your things. And it, it just changes that dynamic so much that I, I really feel that that helped build a very essential relation, uh, uh, effective relationship. Situations where not as great are sometimes you'll get these very disinterested clients. They feel like it's the attorney's job just to get rid of the case. Okay, I've gotten sued, we've hired you, now get rid of it. And then you just, it's like pulling teeth to get information out of them. And you don't really feel like they're really all that engaged. Um, you need to be engaged with the case. You need to have an understanding of what this case is about, where it's going to go, and what the strategies are for getting rid of it. And you have to be part of that team. Even from the outside, you have to be part of that team so that, that they know that you're there to support them and get them what they need. And they, they'll, you'll trust that they're going to be doing what they need to do to make sure that they achieve the goals that you want them to reach, whether the goal is getting rid of it quickly, whether the goal is winning it outright, where the goal is just mitigating the risk, whatever it is, you want to make sure you're on that same page and that you're trusting them to accomplish that goals within the budget. And Catherine, did you have anything to say? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching Laudition. Continue watching programs that will challenge your thinking while getting to know the best lawyers in every field as they share their insights and all while satisfying your CLE requirements. When lawyers audition for new clients, everyone wins. <laughs>